Father, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the wonderful access that's ours, realizing that it was purchased at such a great price. As we fellowship over your precious word, we realize just how little we know and how immense is this word of yours, of our sovereign God. May the Holy Spirit just take this time and speak truth to our hearts, filtering out all of that which is foolish and ignorant, all of that which is error, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle, or the book of John, the Gospel of John, verse by verse. In my last video, although I, I did peek ahead just a few verses, we were someplace between verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1. I don't want to leave verses 11 through 14. No, I just want to stay here. But the Lord says to go on. But what I would like to do in this video is I'd like to, to just not get in any hurry and to take just a little bit more of an in-depth look into what's going on in these in these few verses, uh, four verses in particular. The uh, This section of, of, of the first chapter is so profound. Uh, I just feel the need to hover over these verses a little while longer. I don't, I don't mean to infer by that that it isn't all profound. You know, because it is. Whether or not I, I can do justice to these verses here, folks, is, is a great concern to me. It's a wonderful thing to know that you are redeemed, that Jesus Christ died in your place, that He's God Almighty. He came down because He loved you and He died for you, and that is supremely important. Some, though, however, will say, well, you know, uh, this is just the book of love, you know, the gospel of love, and that's all that we need to know. You know, why do you go through all of this in detail in the verses? These are powerful verses, folks, and I think it's, it's thrilling. Okay, the problem is if you don't know it, you know, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. Okay, you're redeemed. Jesus Christ died in your place. And when I hear Christians say, you know, why go into all the grammar, Steve, and why look at all of the the punctuation and the grammar and the all the, the sentence construction and, and all the textual, you know, the aspects of, of, you know, just everything. Everything that, you know, I read through these, these verses so quickly, you know, uh, I can read through these verses in five minutes. Uh, I get the full force of it. You know, you want to spend four months in it. I don't, I don't understand that. Well, I'm glad that you get that much out of it. I, I'm afraid that I can't say the same thing about myself. When I hear Christians say, why do this? Why go into such detail? God loves us. Isn't that enough? Well, I mean, let's say that, let's say that you marry, you know, this beautiful girl. You know, at least, well, at least she was beautiful when you married her. Would you say it's enough just to know that she loves you? My wife loves me. That's, that's all there is to it. I don't, I don't want a marriage like that. I wouldn't want that kind of a relationship. I want to know everything about my wife. Likewise, the more I can find out about what God has done for me in Christ, the more thrilling it becomes. The more intimate it becomes. And of course, the more that we dig the more we get into the area of textual criticism, grammar, and so on. The 13th verse, the, the authorized version says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And oh my goodness, uh, I just want to say, 
you know, how wonderful it was. I remember the day, I, I remember clearly the day that I made a decision to be born again by my parents. I'll never forget that day, and doesn't that sound silly? I think I pointed out in a, my last video, or the one before it, just how we, we need to take this at face value and not try to explain it away and say, well, that's really, I know it says that, Steve, but I really, you know, I don't believe that. There, there must be some kind of glitch here going on someplace. And I, I may not be able to put my finger on it, but, but by golly, I just can't believe what you're saying. Or I can't believe what that book is saying. I can't believe what that verse is saying. And therein lies the problem. The 13th verse says, We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, depending on the text, uh, an early text, uh, Ter Tertullian, for example, uh, who's been called the father of Latin uh, Christianity and, and actually the founder of Western theology, says that this passage of Scripture deals only with the virgin birth. It doesn't have anything to do with you. And he uses the Latin, which stresses that. And, and based on the Latin, he presents this as a text that deals with the virgin birth. And folks, I think anybody who's done much studying at all knows that that's not right. In John part 3, I laid out my view on that, which was that the grammar appears to me to stress just how intimately we're connected to or we're identified with Christ. And we see that identification with Christ in numerous other passages of, of, the, of the New Testament. You know, most Christians, folks, they, they know and they're well aware of the fact that Jesus Christ died for them. Do a survey sometime. Very few are aware of the fact that when he died, they died with him. We were crucified with him. Now, now folks, that's got to mean something. I think there's a deeply profound truth in the fact that, that we're so intimately connected with Christ in verse 13. I don't think I did a very sufficient job of explaining that in my last video. Now, I'm not asking anybody to, to agree with me, but this is what I see in the text. That it's, in essence, it's referring to both Christ and us, not just the virgin birth, and not just us, but Christ and us. I'll put a chart here on the screen that I believe outlines that so that you can take a, a screenshot of it for those of you who are interested in doing that. I posted this uh, same chart to Facebook. This is a masculine pronoun adjective. It's masculine. So rather than translate it which, I'd like to translate it who, which is what the original Greek says. In fact, if you go to the original Greek, you'll see the word is who. But in addition to that, it's plural. Plural, folks. And the problem with the plural that bothers people is the conjunction between verses 13 and 14 that says, at least grammatically, that the subject of the 13th verse and the subject of the 14th verse are intimately connected. And the 14th verse, of course, deals with the Word becoming flesh. And because of the conjunction, those who agree that Tertullian was wrong in his use of the Latin there still argue that there is the possibility that all we're looking at in the 13th verse is the virgin birth because of the conjunction that exists between verses 13 and 14. And what I tried to point out to you last week is a marvelous truth. It is the truth. Bear in mind the pronoun adjective of who is masculine plural. It's masculine plural. As many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become 
children of God. The KJV says sons, as, as though it's we us, it's technon. I, I know I pointed that out. It's technon, children of God. In John's Gospel, the Holy Spirit never uses the expression sons of God. Never, never uses it. We are adult children of God. So the word is really not sons, but children. He gave them the authority, the right, the privilege. You could, you could translate that privilege to become children of God. And for those who reject the truth of the security of the believer, it's an aorist. It isn't something they are and, and then they aren't and they are and they aren't. They are, that's it. To them that believe on his name. The 12th verse is showing us that the basis of being a child of God is not believing. The basis of believing is being a child of God. Children of God believe. They don't become children of God by believing. They could not believe if they were not already children of God. And the reason that they're children of God is they were born. Verse 13, it's an aorist passive. It only happens once. You're not spiritually born over and over and over and over again. In verse 12, they're alive, so it can't be physical birth that we're talking about. They're believing, and the basis of their belief is a spiritual basis, so it is a spiritual birth, and it's a limited birth. It's limited to those who, are, who believe, who are believers. And we've been building up to the revelation that, that seemed to bother Nicodemus, and that is that God has performed a twofold justification. He's removed spiritually the condemnation of Adam's transgression, which fell on all of those in verse 12, that was removed in Christ. And also, they were justified from their own condemnation. By what? The Word becoming flesh. All of this happened when the Word became flesh, tabernacled among us, gave Himself in our place, and ascended up on high so that there is so intimate a connection between our spiritual birth and the incarnation that it can't be separated. If there had been a law given, I mean, isn't that what the Scriptures say? If by any chance there had been a law given, that give us life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. Couldn't be any other way. Now, when you read that scripture, if, if there had been a law given which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been or would have been by the law. You have to realize that what that text is saying is man is totally depraved. Can't do it. He can't do it. There isn't anything like a spiritual birth separate from the Incarnation. They are intimately tied together, and the Word was made flesh. Now, in Greek grammar, there, there's places where the definite article's not there in the Greek, but it, it's surely inferred, like with a noun. You know, in Greek, we can say Trump is president rather than say Trump is the president because the definite article is inferred. But in the construction where we have two nouns connected by a verb, such as we have here, the word was made flesh. It is of supreme interest as to whether each noun is articulated in the Greek. If they are, they are absolute equals, and you can reverse the sentence. The flesh was made the word and the Word was made the flesh. It doesn't say that. And the detail is what brings a thrill to the heart. The language, folks, is so precise that it is saying that all that the flesh was was the Word, but the Word was much more than the flesh. In fact, what the Greek says here in four little words is so profound that the human mind has never been able to fully articulate it. In those four words, we are told that the eternal, everlasting Word who was in the beginning and spoke the worlds into existence, who, who hung the stars in the sky, 
became flesh without ceasing to be the Word. Now that, theologically, is supremely important. Believe me, much of the congregation of people who call themselves Christian, whether or not they articulate it clearly, still have the underlying conviction that Jesus Christ is something less than God. There are people who call themselves Christian who believe that the Word didn't start until the virgin birth. Though the Holy Spirit has gone out of His way to emphasize the eternality of the Word. When God Almighty became incarnate in human flesh, He did not cease to be God. Though many and many a Christian never worried about that thought to even entertain the possibility that Jesus Christ incarnate ceased to be God is to cause all of your theology to collapse. I, I've tried to get the point across how that our theology has to be consistent. It must be consistent, folks, or it comes crashing down like a house of cards. We wind up faced with contradiction after contradiction after contradiction, which leads to confusion after confusion after confusion. It is the major cause for much of the confusion today. Consistency. Not one verse contradicts another. What if Jesus Christ in the garden said, Father, now, and I don't want to go to the cross, but nevertheless, if you want me to, I'll go. Then he asked something that was out of the will of the Father, and he sinned, and you're not redeemed. It's that simple. And yet the great majority of Christianity preaches that Jesus Christ prayed something that wasn't God's will and, and, and assumes that you can make that right. Didn't he go on to say, nevertheless, thy will be done? Sure, honey, I'd like to spend two weeks with, you know, well, uh, with this uh, gorgeous blonde, but nevertheless, thy will be done. Now, I don't know about your wife. You know, that wouldn't go over very well with mine. Folks, if he asked something out of the will of the Father, he, he knew it was out of the will of the Father. The Son of Man must do this, this, and this, and be delivered, condemned, crucified, put to death. That's what He told His disciples. He knew what He was doing, folks. He knew what He was doing. If He asks something that wasn't God's will, He's not God. And it's that simple. And here in four words, we're told that all that God was did not cease in the Incarnation. All that God is, is not flesh. But all that the Incarnation was, was God. It wasn't all of God, but all of it was God. And the Incarnation did not cease to be God. He divested Himself of His glory but he did not divest himself of his deity. Somehow it's, it's, I believe, impossible, at least impossible, this side of heaven to even begin to comprehend what it meant for the Word to be made flesh. It doesn't say he was born. It says he was made flesh. And... You know, we don't know much about the courts of glory. We do know that our God is a great God. We do know that the, the Word spoke the worlds into existence and that He holds them in the hollow of His hand. He holds them together. That by His might and His might alone, creation is held together. And to leave the adulation of the angels, the glory of heaven to become flesh is a step that exceeds human comprehension and yet absolutely necessary if we are to be born from above. What we are seeing, folks, in verses 13 and 14 is that intimate, unbreakable connection between those who belong to Christ and the sacrifice made in their place, the price that He paid for us, and His becoming flesh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That's what we're seeing. That's what I see in this passage. And I, I folks, I'm, I just can't breeze over this quickly just to go on down to the River Jordan wherever John the Baptist was baptizing. 
Please note the absence of the definite article before flesh. It doesn't say the flesh. He did not cease to be the word when he was made flesh. And then he tabernacled among us. My Bible says dwelt. Dwelt among us. It's the Greek word for tabernacle or tent. Many of you know that. He was here temporarily among us. It's interesting that, you know, this is the word that the Septuagint uses for the tabernacle in the wilderness. It also was temporary. It was always there with the Israelites. And as they moved through that wilderness, it moved with them. It became permanent when they entered the land of rest. And that, of course, is a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ because when we enter into that final rest, it's no longer a temporary tabernacle. It's the place where, where sacrifice was made, the incarnation died in our place. It's the place where the Israelite met God, and it's the place where we meet God, we have access to God, where we are new creations in Christ. It was the center of their worship as the Lord Jesus Christ is the center of our worship. The tabernacle becoming Solomon's temple is a beautiful illustration in the Old Testament of our risen Savior. He's our rock. No God like our God. No rock like our rock. He tabernacled among us and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. The word behold there is the Greek word that's used for the audience in a theatrical performance. And I believe there's a clear indication in the, in the text that His glory, full of grace and truth, is not based on any synergism whatsoever of the believer. Both we, I believe that we is we is characteristic of the of the disciples who were there when Jesus Christ was was here we can look back in the text and see his glory full of grace and truth but we were not physically here when he temporarily tabernacled with them we now have however the risen Christ the center of our worship no longer is there any wandering aimlessly in the wilderness we're centered in Christ, but the testimony of the evangelist is that we saw it. We were there. We actually saw it. There's some argument about what's, what's involved in this, but everybody agrees it, it's at least, at the very least, at the very, very least, it's uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. And the... And the the one that the Holy Spirit is using to pen these words was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. There's been a lot of, lots of discussion about, uh, you know, they saw when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when he gave sight to the blind, healed the leper, uh, you know, when the lame walked, when the water was turned into wine. And we know all of those things are true. I don't know, you know, whether the thought here is referring to the Mount of Transfiguration or just walking daily with Christ, that must have been an amazing experience. It must have been something that's difficult to put into words. And the wonderful, amazing aspect about that is that we don't have much about that from the human standpoint. I mean, that's all that we'd write about. If you're, if you're careful in your study, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read all four Gospels, you, you study them, in great detail and, and you come to the conclusion you know how many days in the earthly life of Christ are you looking at some have actually suggested no more than a couple of weeks two, two weeks out of the three years that he was here on earth now I admit that the Holy Spirit says at the end here that these have been written that you might believe, but there's a whole bunch of things that he did that just haven't been written, couldn't be written, written, could not have been written. And I, you know, I and I, I can think, you know, of modern journalism today, how much time that they would spend on, you know, the leper, you know, the the blind, 
the raising of Lazarus, man, oh man, I mean, we'd spend a lot of time on that because, you know, it's probably fake, right? And we only have a few verses. The emphasis is not on the miracles he performed. They were the testimony. They were the credentials that he was the promised Messiah. But the emphasis in God's word is on what he did for us. A subject that seems to be of such little interest to Christians today. Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham offered up Isaac, his only begotten, and we know that Abraham had what, Ishmael? He had Ishmael, and he had what, four or five other kids by Keturah? So he had at least six kids, maybe seven, and yet he calls Isaac his only begotten. Now you could argue that he calls Isaac his only begotten because he was the only one that he had by Sarah, but your argument really wouldn't hold much water. Because the word really means beloved. I think 20-something times it's translated in the Greek Septuagint for the Hebrew word beloved. Beloved. It's a word that points out how special, how important the child is. Greatly loved. It doesn't mean that he's the only one born of God. There isn't one verse of Scripture anywhere that says Jesus Christ was begotten of God, that is, born of God. Doesn't exist. And yet great numbers of Christians somehow seem to think that God came upon Mary like a husband comes upon his wife and she became pregnant. Not true. Mary was the vehicle by which the Word became flesh. But no place is Jesus Christ, God's child, we beheld His glory as the glory of the Beloved of the Father, and in fact, He's called Beloved at His baptism. This is my Beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, and I could spend well, at least an hour on that. Why? Because the Father is only pleased with you because of Christ in you. The only person that He ever said that He was fully pleased with was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ lives in you. You have been accepted in the Beloved. We have been accepted in the Beloved. Now don't get me wrong, the, the Beloved Son is not the, the same word, but the word is one that stresses the special uniqueness of the individual Isaac was Abraham's unique son, his beloved son, his special son. The Word became flesh, and this was beloved of God. This is my beloved son, my special son, full of grace and truth. Over and over again, folks, I have stressed the fact that the Word of God is our only source of truth, and the Word of God, of course, is the Word. I don't believe that you can separate a man from his Word, or, or that you shouldn't even try. What we are studying is the Word of the everlasting God, the revelation of God, the Word, and it, it is our source of truth. Jesus Christ is the source of truth. And isn't it thrilling that He's grace and truth? And yet we struggle at the idea of grace. Amazing. To call it unmerited favor is, is, well, it's certainly correct, but, but does that really do the word justice? Do we understand that we were God's enemy, that we weren't seeking Him, we weren't working for Him, that we weren't desiring Him, that we weren't pleasing Him, that we, we were not subject to His law, that we had no ability to be subject to His law, and that as His enemies, as those who hated Him, who sh I'd say despised Him, what did He do? He showered on us grace. Redemption. Justified freely without a cause. Surely the grace of God, you know, you folks see that 
illustrated in Israel coming out of the land of Egypt. You know, why are we here? We don't want to be here. Grumbling, complaining, whining, moaning, complaining all the time. They weren't paying no taxes. They weren't buying any clothes. They didn't have to worry about food. But they wanted to go back to Egypt and eat garbage. And had I been God, well, that's probably where they'd have gone. Good thing I'm not God. And I believe the Holy Spirit is... Rev I, I remember getting angry watching the old uh, Charleston Heston movie, The Ten Commandments, getting mad at the, you know, the, the old man wanting to, trying to get Aaron to create the golden calf, you know, it's just mad. Just mad at these people, you know. Oh, that's another subject. I believe the Holy Spirit is revealing in every page of Scripture how gracious God is. Our Redeemer was full of grace and truth. We can trust Him. He loves you folks with an everlasting love. He knows the way you take. When He's tested you, you shall, there's no doubt about it, you shall come forth as gold. You can be absolutely, 100%, absolutely assured that He's able to keep that which you've committed unto Him against that day. That, he haul, that now, right even now, right now, He always causes you to triumph. He's truth. These aren't things that we question, or these aren't things that we should question. God really is gracious. He's gracious when you suffer. He's gracious when you're on top of the heap. He's gracious when you, 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 you know, when... Well, he's just, I could give you a thousand examples. He's gracious when you die. He's gracious when you live. Some people wonder, you know, maybe feel that they'd rather be in heaven than the mess they're in. Why can't we just bask in his grace, folks? He's the God of all grace. If you study all of the religions of the world, there's no, there's no such subject, no idea of love between the God and the worshiper or, or, or even, even the worshiper of the God. God showering upon us that which we, of course, did not deserve. More than that, we didn't want it. We were hostile to Him. You know, I always find it supremely astounding to stand back and watch Christians stumble around in the dark trying to explain what the Christian life is all about when it's never even... They've never stopped long enough to even consider the fact that it's... Jesus Christ. And folks, I'll tell you, if you have a need that God hasn't met or is presently meeting, He's not your Father. Well, I'm out of time, folks. Time seems to fly right by in these videos. I, I want to take a moment to thank you all for all of your all of your prayers, all of your concern, all your messages, all of your emails, all of those who contact me, sharing your life stories, your testimonies with me, all of the fellowship on Facebook, all of the support, all of just everything. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.